In today's video, we'll unbox the Zima board, dive into its features, and then compare it to the Zima Blade to see which mini PC is the ultimate solution for your home server, NAS, or media center setup in 2025. Stick around to find out. A few videos back, I reviewed the Zima Blade, a compact mini PC that replaced my full size home server setup. It is priced at only around $100, it comes in a much smaller form factor with easier maintenance, and its power consumption is just a few watts, which is a pretty huge deal if you're running multiple of these in your home lab. Its specs are also pretty solid, it's capable of 4K video transcoding without a hassle, and it's able to run all of the apps I usually use. So for my needs, it really was a perfect replacement for the huge PC I used to have before. The conclusion of the review was that the Zima Blade is a pretty awesome mini PC, but some of you may not know that it has a pretty solid predecessor too. I'm talking about the Zima board, which was released first and offers more ports and flexibility for advanced home server projects like a DIY router for example. When you spec these out, the components inside are pretty much the same, so my question was, what's the real difference between the two and which one is for me? Looking at them side by side, the first thing you see is dual gigabit ports on the Zima board. Almost the whole housing is made from aluminium and is essentially one large heatsink, which will definitely help with thermal throttling and could potentially give you more power because of greater CPU cooling. The Zima blade on the other hand has upgradable RAM for example, which I bet a lot of people would appreciate. I got mine with a pretty cool NAS kit and I'd say its power supply is done much better, but before we get into the detailed comparison, there's one thing I have to do and that's unbox the Zima board and take a deep look at it so you can see what's inside the box and what to expect. The guys over at Icefell killed it with the unboxing experience on these, so I can't leave these out. These are after all relatively cheap Chinese products, but you can see how premium this look and feel. The actual kit comes inside a larger box. The kit includes the Zima board and its power supply. And you can see that they are going all in with recyclable materials, which started to be the trend in the last few years. The first thing we see is a thank you card with a discord link on the back, which tells me that they are growing a massive home lab community, which is a really good thing to have. Then we get some stickers and under them lay the Zima board and its power supply on the right. The power supply is a basic AC to DC brick, but this time it is a battle jack instead of a USB Type-C connector like on the Zima blade. It is a 12V slash 3A power supply unit and I do have the same one plugged in 24 7 for the last 3 months at this point and it's still going strong. You also get different plug adapters inside the box and the input voltage is 100 to 240V so it will work regardless of where you are located in the world. Next comes the Zima board and I can't stop appreciating how much effort went into the box. It's such a cool unboxing experience and I'm going to keep quiet for a bit so you can enjoy it the same way I did. And that's it, it was fun while it lasted, and this is usually the part of the video where I would start begging you for a like, so if you enjoyed this epic unboxing experience, I encourage you to leave this video a like. I heard it helps with the algorithm, so it would be much appreciated. As you just saw, inside the box we get the Zima board, and a special SATA cable which is needed if you want to connect external drives to the SATA ports. The first thing that caught my eye is the dual Ethernet ports, which make this board a pretty solid networking tool. This whole body is one huge piece of aluminium, which is also the main CPU heatsink, but this time we also get some ribs on top to increase its surface area, which will drastically improve with the cooling performance. I bet that the majority of people would agree that this is a pretty well designed product, and it overall feels of very high quality. It uses a 5.5 by 2.5 mm battle jack for power, and the input voltage range is not specified anywhere, so I would strictly stick to 12 volts to be safe. We get dual gigabit LAN ports with two full size USB connectors. These are USB 3.0 ports, and on the left we have a mini display port, which is capable of 4K 60 resolution. On the other side, we have two SATA 3.0 ports, which are 6GB, and in the middle of them is a connector for SATA power supply. 
If you plan to power an external drive from the Zima board, you need a special cable to do so. It is the same thing as on the Zima blade, and I would say that they did this to save space on the PCB which is great, but it means that you need this special cable if you plan to connect more drives. The last thing is a PCIe 2.0 x4 slot, which is a pretty cool addition to this small setup. In the last video I didn't really have many PCIe cards to show off this feature, but this time I came prepared. You can connect two drives with the SATA ports on the back, but if you for example have something like this, you can easily plug it into the Zima board and expand your storage even more. With this adapter you get a pair of M2 SSDs with one more separate SATA port. Icefail makes a ton of these cards, so make sure to check their website to see all of the different options. If expanding your storage isn't your thing, how about a 2.4 gig NIC instead? This PCI slot comes with endless options and it's really nice to have on such a small setup, but there is small design flaw with it and for this I'm talking both about the Zima board and the blade. The distance between the edge of the board and the PCI connector is a bit too long and this makes installing most PCI cards impossible because the metal bracket gets in the way. It's just a few millimeters off and it's pretty weird that they didn't fix this issue on the Zima blade. Thankfully, almost every PCI card out there has an easily removable bracket and when you do so, the card doesn't catch anything and fits perfectly in place. That's one way to fix it and the other way would be to get a PCI eraser to move the card further from the connector. I kept thinking about the huge difference in cooling performance between the two and I wanted to see if I could improve it even more. To help me do this comes the sponsor of today's video, JLC PCB. I found some 50mm fans from previous projects and immediately started drawing a mount for them in Fusion. JLC PCB has been a leading PCB manufacturer for almost 20 years at this point, but they recently started offering some pretty cool services like advanced 3D printing and CNC milling. A big part of my job is CNC programming and operation, so I really wanted to test these out. Once the design was completed, I exported all of the parts and uploaded them to jlcpcb.com. After their technician checked everything, the files were put into production and were delivered to me only a week after. The mount I designed is made from three pieces in total. The ABS bottom plate will replace the original one that is made from plexiglass. The new plate I designed has some threaded holes on the side, to which I will be able to connect this aluminum connector piece that will hold the fence above the heatsink. Three more bolts to connect the whole mount together and then come the fence. This turned out really good. The parts are machined perfectly and I can't wait to test this thing out, so make sure to leave a comment if that's something you'd like to see. When you're ready to take your project to the next level, make sure to visit jlcpcb.com by clicking on the first link in the video's description. Thank you for watching and thank you JLCPCB for sponsoring today's video. This is after all a pretty advanced YouTube tech channel, so taking a look at a product without disassembling it doesn't make much sense in my book. The whole bottom is made from plexiglass and there are Phillips screws holding everything together. Once you undo this, the whole thing falls apart and on the bottom the first thing we see is the RTC battery. This is after all the same thing as a full-sized ATX motherboard, so it does have a BIOS and a small battery just like a regular PC. On this side we can see the power LED and there is one connector which I would say makes connecting an external CPU fan possible. To remove the PCB from the heatsink there are two more screws and once those are out the PCB can be removed from the heatsink. There is thermal paste on the power supply, the memory chips and on the CPU. Everything looks pretty well done, but while watching this video you may have asked yourself a question that was on my mind for a very long time. As I already said, this is basically a PC, but in a much smaller form factor. Well, where is the power button? This thing is designed to be run 24-7 without being powered on and off. It comes with a pretty low TDP, so that's totally fine, and it is configured to automatically turn on when the power supply is connected. These settings can be easily changed in the BIOS, but if you really want a power button, the pins are broken out same as on a regular PC. You have the power button pins, as well as the reset button pins. You have hard drive status lights, and my favorite, 5 volts and ground. They made a slot on the bottom plexiglass cover, so you can easily run these wires outside, but you will have to solder them yourself, which may be an issue for some people. For the teardown I would say that's it, so let's quickly put it all together and talk about the main differences between the board and the blade. This video was a pretty detailed Zima board review until this point, but I did promise a comparison, so here it is. When spec'd out, both of these come with the same components, so in terms of running apps and their capabilities, they are identical. Spec'd out, the Zima blade comes with a $80 decrease, but it also comes without any memory, so a RAM stick is something you will have to buy separately. A 16GB stick from Icewell will cost you $40, so in the end the Zima blade will be $40 less, but will have 8GB of RAM more than the Zima board, which could be a pretty nice upgrade. The Zima blade is much smaller, has more plastic, a drastically smaller heatsink, 
only a single Ethernet port and only a single USB port, but it's powered from USB Type-C, which can be used as a USB hub while providing power as well. The upgradable memory is the true selling point of this small thing and in my opinion it is perfect for a DIY NAS because you can get this small NAS kit with it too and the whole thing is super customizable and compact. Zima board on the other hand is a bit larger and feels way more robust. I bet building some kind of a cluster with these with external fan cooling would be pretty cool and this chunk of aluminium really makes a big difference. Its biggest downside is soldered and non-upgradable RAM and the most you can get is 8 gigs. Other differences are the LAN ports and more USB ports. But again, the power connector is a barrel jack instead of a USB Type-C, which I personally don't like. Both of these come with 32GB of eMMC 5.1 memory installed on board, which can easily be expanded in any way you want. So to answer the question, it really depends on you. Both of these are pretty capable boards, with the Zima board being ready for a bit more intense tasks, while the Blade is a smaller and more affordable version with upgradable RAM. The whole boot up process is identical and it can be seen in the original Zima Blade review, so I'll make sure to leave it linked in the description below this video. Make sure to let me know what you want to see next, and I hope that the like button is already blue at this point. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos, and I will see you in the next one.